Welcome to Roberts and Jenna's live this time for April 3rd in the year of our Lord 2024. So glad you could be with us today. As you know, this program is set aside for you to ask your questions, give your comments on any topic whatsoever. And I, as my role as host of this program, will endeavor to answer your questions to the best of my ability using our Catholic faith, scripture, tradition, the fathers, the medievals, the saints, the doctors, the popes, the councils, encyclopedias, the catechisms, and just about anything I can find to help you walk away satisfied that your question has indeed been answered. We come to you every Wednesday from 3 to 5 p.m., barring any difficulties, catastrophes, tsunamis, earthquakes, whatever. And um, last week when we had our program, I spent an hour and a quarter preaching. And uh, I'm not going to do that this week. This week I'm going to concentrate on your questions, try to get through as many as I can. So if you haven't had the opportunity to ask a question before, please join our chat room and fire away. And I will endeavor to answer your questions as much as I am able to do so. Okay, just a couple of news items. And um, um, can't let these go, of course, you know. There's so much happening in the church today, so um, you got to keep up with stuff to find out if you've heard everything. You know that saying, you think you've heard everything until the next day comes and you hear something new. So, <laughs> all right. Um, I'm a little tired today, so I, I might be dragging through here. Who knows? Um but I'll, I'll promise to give you as, as good a show as we can give you. Okay. Um, um, <laughs> there's this new thing about Judas. Uh, there's a lot of talk about um, would Judas be forgiven or did Judas go to heaven or blah, blah. And um, the Pope our illustrious Pope. Um, uh, first of all, what he did was he got 12 women together and washed their feet on Holy Thursday. And there's a picture of it. Um, oh, he went to the prison. It looks like women's prison. Got 12 inmates, women, sat them down on a long bench, and one by one, um, took them 12 minutes. This is March 28th. Um, on the outskirts of Rome, poured water over their feet, dried them with a towel, and kissed their feet. Um, 12 women inmates at Rome's Rebibia prison. And they wept as the Pope did this. So, um, you know, <laughs> you know, if the Lord Jesus hadn't washed the feet of the disciples, um, you know, this would be no big deal. You know, if you want to go wash women's feet and kiss them, you know, I don't have any objections to that, especially, you know, they made them cry and made them, maybe they were sorry for their sins and that helped them move closer to where they should be. Um, I, you know, I don't have a problem with that. You know, I, if you know me, I don't have a problem with a lot of externals. Okay. Those props that we use. Um, not that, the props don't serve a purpose, okay? They help people to feel things that they normally wouldn't feel, I guess, okay? I'm not a prop person myself, okay? I don't need props. You can give me a room with bare walls, and I'd be happy as long as I had my books with me. <laughs> um, but um, what am I trying to say here? I'm trying to say that... 
Um, I don't like to criticize. I wouldn't want to criticize the Pope here for doing this because, you know, look, as Christians, we have freedom. That's, that's the main thing Paul tried to get across. You're not a slave. And you, the only slave you would be is a slave to Christ. But you're free. You can do what you want and not worry whether it's you my sinning, you know, and, and, you, and you lock yourself up in a room because you're so scared you're going to sin somewhere. You've got freedom. And you want to go wash women's feet and, and you know, dry them, and whatever. Uh, I, I don't have a problem. What, but what I do have a problem with is the sort of mimicking of the Last Supper, where Jesus had 12 men, no women, and washed their feet and said, look, this is the way I want you to treat each other. I want you to forgive each other. I want you to humble yourself. Take away the pride, because if you got pride, don't bother being a Christian. Don't even pretend. Okay? It's just not there. The only way you can be Christian is to be humble. And um, that's the lesson he wanted to teach them. And what what is more humbling than washing somebody's feet, for crying out loud? Especially, you know, in this day where feet were always exposed, you might have had sandals, and um, uh, but your feet are always exposed, always getting dirty. Um, actually, you know, when you think about it, maybe that's the best way to do it is because our shoes are always covered up. So that means our feet are today, that is, our, our feet are going to sweat. And when the sweat hits the oxygen, <laughs> There's a lot of foul smelling going around. So, you know, they might have had a better idea in those days. Um, so, and it's probably a lot healthier. You know, you get toenail fungus and, you know, all kinds of funguses on your feet if you have them wrapped up all the time with shoes. Um, but it's just the mimicking of this to, it's, because Jesus did it with men and did it with men for a purpose, because they were going to lead the church. If you're going to be a leader of the church, you want to be humble. Because the minute you're not, people are going to pick it up. And your days are numbered. You know, Paul was proud. Peter was proud. Barnabas was proud. Uh, who else did God have to teach? Uh, especially Paul, <laughs> this guy, <laughs> you know, it's like Moses that God had to, to chastise, um, and send him in the desert for 40 years. And even that didn't break him. It broke him sufficiently, but he still had some ways to go. <laughs> Poor Moses. And then Paul. He is hits the the gas pedal as soon as he gets converted in Acts nine, and he goes out preaching, doing miracles, and then you don't hear about him anymore for for a while. He's gone for eight years, and then and Peter is now the focus of the book of Acts. So where did he go? Well, he went to this little place called Sancreia, and. We don't even, we're not even sure what he did there, but I'm sure he was, because he was getting uppity when he was preaching the gospel in the book of Acts and God sent him away. And when he came back, he was, he was humble and um, thank God for that. Um, but even when he came back, there was an instance where he, um, he wants to go to Jerusalem. He has to go to Jerusalem keep saying this to himself. And uh, so he's making all these plans and there's where the Jews are. That's why Jesus didn't go into Jerusalem. For most of his three and a half years, he was in Galilee and Perea and um, what's the other side there uh, by the lake. Um, and then on the final week, then he goes to Jerusalem, the final week of three and a half years. Why? 
because the darn Jews are there and they're going to kill them. And they got their heart set on it. As a matter of fact, these Pharisees used to follow him around when he was in Galilee, which is what, about 70 miles from Jerusalem. And, uh, you know, Mark down, oh, he was here this day, here that day, you know, and trying to get a sort of an itinerary so they could be there wherever he was going to be. And, of course, Jesus was always silent about it, didn't tell them where he was going to go. It was like a surprise. What are we going to do today, Jesus? Well, I think we'll go to, you know, Capernaum. And um, <clears throat> so, you know, the Pharisees tried to find out as much as they could. And uh, but Paul wants to go to Jerusalem and the Holy Spirit, uh, he goes to um, Caesarea first because that's on the way to Jerusalem from where he was. He was in Corinth and um, he goes to Caesarea and meets these uh, um was it Jewish converts or Gentile? I forget. In Caesarea, and they say, God came to us, the Holy Spirit came to us and told us to tell you not to go to Jerusalem because you they will seek your life. And why was that important? Well, hey, he just, you know, became a Christian. He's ready to convert the world as God's greatest evangelist. And he wants to go give up his life in Jerusalem just because he has an affection for Jerusalem and the Jews down there. Wait till he gets down there. And we'll find out there is no affection the other way. And uh, so uh, he says, no, I'm going to Jerusalem. And then um, Agabus, the prophet, uh, comes there. God sent him there. And, and Agabus doesn't say no don't go to jerusalem he just says the man that wears this belt is going to suffer at the hands of the jews and you know just guess who that is so he has a second warning that this is not playtime this this is real these prophecies are real and you go down there you're going to get yourself in trouble and he barely escapes. He goes down there and he barely escapes getting killed. I mean, these Jews down there were bloodthirsty. They hated anything to do with Christianity. And Paul was one of their own. And all of a sudden he's gone. And oh, man. So, you know, you got to. <laughs> even So it, it took a while to get Paul to the position where he should be in his humility. But, you know, thank God for his verve. I mean, here's a guy who, you know, could be sitting home eating, you know, milk duds and, um, you know, watching TV. And uh, no, he's just got too much energy. He's ready to go out to conquer the world. He just has a little bit too much pride. And that's always hard for a Christian, especially one with a strong personality, strong will you know, to curb his will and his personality so that you don't step on too many toes out there and yet have the energy and the determination to go out there and preach the gospel because that ain't easy, as Paul will find out. In many places that he goes, people aren't ready to listen like he thinks they are. I mean, it takes a lot of work, and he's got to do a lot of strategy to try to get him at the best times possible, just like it is today. Okay, so yeah, it's so you have to have that right balance between verve, that's you know excitement, and humility. And there's the rare man that has the correct combination to that. Some guys are just too wimpy. And other guys are just like stepping all over everybody to get to the top. And, you know, that's how life works. Anyway, so I wanted to get that thing done by the, because a lot of people were complaining about that. And, you know, I sympathize with them. And, uh, and then, of course, he tells them, um, oh, to women prisoners. Okay. He tells them that God can forgive them 
because God forgave Judas, which is implying that Judas is not in hell, which has always been the Catholic tradition, uh, that he somehow, um, the guy that Jesus said had a devil in him, in John, what, 666? And um, it has nothing to do with 666 now, okay? Um, um, because it may be 666, six, six, chapter 6, verse 67, I think it might be, actually. Anyway, um, you know, it's always been the tradition. Because, look, if Judas isn't in hell, I mean, here's the guy who went and committed suicide. Um, and the Acts makes a big deal about it, that he committed, you know, and right the, that he went this way and was, you know, his it was prophesied and blah, blah, blah. And then, oh, uh, well, you know. But this is the typical liberal mentality. Everybody should be saved, you know. It's like, you know, God, you got us into this mess in the first place. It's your responsibility to get everybody out. I mean, after all, if you didn't make us and, you know, do whatever you're doing, whatever it is, um, we'd all uh, be fine. Okay. Well, you got some test to prove or whatever. And so, you know, everybody deserves to be saved. Why do, why, why do we get the brunt of what you're being challenged with about your own deity? whatever that is. Um, come on, <laughs> give us all a break. That's the liberal mentality. And see, God is the, is the one who, who created us in his image. And as such, we take on the responsibility of being a being, you see. And you can no longer, from day one, once God creates you, you can no longer blame your circumstance, your potential, your this, your that on God, okay? Because you are two separate beings. You can pray to God and get his help, but you're two separate beings. It's not like um, God's still part of you, and, and so he has to take responsibility for the things that go wrong in your life or things that you can't do or this or that, okay? <laughs> it's just not the way it works, okay? And if you live that way, you're going to be disappointed. But the liberals have this mentality where, you know, they're, that they're sort of removed from the responsibility of taking on their responsibilities. And somehow, God is the one that's at fault. He's the blame. And so, uh, you know, like I said, you got us into this mess, you need to get us out kind of mentality that they have, which is not Christian, okay? What's Christian is, look, you've been given a free will to love, serve, and obey God, and if you don't, here are the consequences, okay? And um, those consequences can be pretty stiff, I mean, even, even Christians have to go to purgatory to make up for their sins. And the reason we can do that is because Christ went to the cross and gave us that opportunity. That's part of the grace of Christ, because you could say, hey, forget about it. You ain't getting in the door. He could say that. So I'm here, I'm going to give you an opportunity by my grace to do what you should have done. Okay. So we, we as human beings made in the image of God, man, we got a lot of responsibility. We are, I mean, there's no escape from it. Uh, you can't make any excuses. But the liberals, you can spot a liberal a mile away because they're the people who they want to forgive. Everybody. That's why they want the border open in the South. You know, who cares whether they're criminals or this or that or whatever? Who cares whether their own countries aren't the ones kicking them out? I mean, that point was raised the other day where where's all the newspaper stories about, you know, Venezuela and Chile and uh, Uruguay and all these countries kicking out the people that live or in Mexico? All the countries in Mexico, where are all the news stories about them being kicked out? of their own country. There are none. Okay. 
So it's like, where are they all coming from? And for and why? All right, but the liberals, oh man, it doesn't matter what your story is. Doesn't matter what the bad we're not going to vet you. We're just going to let because we're merciful, you see. And that's what it is to be liberal. We're just merciful. And so the Pope's merciful for Judas. He's forgetting the gospel. Okay, because there's no indication in scripture or tradition that Judas um repented to the point of receiving salvation. It's just the opposite. But we're, you see, we're we're going to show you that we're we know better. We know better than you Christians who try to keep the rules because we just shed mercy on anybody, you see. Uh, and they think they're so holy for doing that. Of course, then you have Christians on the other side, okay, who who think they're so holy that they can't forgive anybody for doing anything. Okay, you got to watch that side of the of the fence too. As I said, you have to have a balance in all these things. All right, um, enough with the Pope. I'll get to your questions in a second here. Um, bu- 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 bu. Oh yeah, there was a big hullabaloo because. Um, Candace Owens uh, referred to Christ as the king. And all these, um, I don't know, what would you call them? Uh, Zionists, whatever. Uh, Christian Zionists, Jewish Zionists, all they all came after her. Because you can't say Christ is the king anymore. That's anti-Semitic, for crying out loud. This is what it's going to get to, I'm telling you. Um, and, uh, you know, I wrote a book, if you haven't seen it yet, called, um, where is it here? Supersessionism is Irrevocable. And those who aren't abiding by what we have learned in our faith are doing this very thing. You know, can't say Christ the King on the air anymore. Because, you know, that's discrimination of religions. Because the Jews, we don't believe in Christ. We believe he's a deluded fraud. And so you can't say Christ is the king. If we're all going to get together, you know, and be one and, you know, not point the finger. So, yeah, look out, people. This is coming down the pike. And fortunately... um, She was glad to be fired by Ben Shapiro for uh, saying Christ the King. All right. Um, What else do we have here? Somebody was saying the Synod, the Synod of Synodality, whatever, is coming after your children in your Catholic schools with LGBTQ indoctrination. John uh, Gravino wrote this. And um, <clears throat> so I, I just, I'm not going to talk too much about this, but yeah, I, I can see that happening. You know, they're going to make everybody conform. And that's the thing is, you know, they want the liberals want so much freedom, but yet, but they want you to conform to their dictates on how you should be a, a, a uh, you know, true Christian. You accept everybody, you see. Because everybody's made in the image of God, so all that stuff. All right. Enough of that. So, see, I only went for 25 minutes preaching. So, all right. Let's see what we got today. All righty. Question. What are the differences between the ransom theory of atonement and penal substitution? Penal substitutionary atonement. And which, if either, is the correct view? Well, they're both wrong. Okay. You know the 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 irony, utter irony of this whole topic is um is that the our our faith is based on um the atonement, okay? And, you know, Jesus 
the Father take care of our sins. They're atoned for. And so we now can live freely as a Christian and anticipate going to heaven. But if there's one subject that most people don't know how it works, it's the atonement. Okay. And I find that uncanny that, you know, we always say Jesus died on the cross for my sins. Okay. But what does that mean? What did he do on the cross? What was the cross required for? Well, he died for my sins. Well, why did he have to die for your sins? What's the, what does that do? Okay. Let's, let's be honest with our religion. Let's not just use formulae. Let's ask the question, what did that do? Okay. Because after he died, he rose again, right? Three days later, he rose again from the dead. All right. So I see the result of that, the resurrection. But what did the death do? Okay. Um, and we could say, well, in you know, because Adam sinned, and and then the punishment of that was death. Okay. So we have another Adam come, whose name is Jesus Christ, and he's put through the test, and he obeys. Okay. All right. So he obeys. What does that does that do anything? The fact that Jesus obeyed the Father, whereas Adam did not obey the Father. Does that do anything for our salvation? Okay. And the answer to that, believe it or not, would be no. Okay. I mean, the only thing it did was that it kept Jesus pure. And God the Father is going to, as we will find out, is going to want a pure sacrifice, absolutely pure. I mean, like in the Old Testament, you know, you couldn't have an animal that was mangled or was missing legs or ears or, you know, they had to be perfect, okay? Because that meant that you were giving a perfect specimen to God as a sacrifice. So Jesus had to be perfect in order to serve as a sacrifice, but that only got him to the stage, so to speak. Okay. Only the pure could go to the stage and then put on the act, so to speak, of, not. and I'm not using that derogatorily, I'm just saying that there's another stage now that he has to go through uh, that uh, is going to give us the atonement. So you have to ask the question, well, what was that? Now, um, some believe that it's because, you know, he suffered. You know, like the, the movie of Mel Gibson, you know, what was that called? The, um, the Passion. I haven't seen that around as much, but that was all the way back in 2004. That's 20 years ago. My goodness. Um, but that movie was... Um, was displaying the suffering that Christ went through. I mean, we had that scene where he is chained to the post in the courtyard that's humongous, and the guy, the, the Roman soldier, is whipping him, and he goes to 39 or 40 lashes, and, and Jesus is like, he's hanging on, and he's faltering, and I think he falls down, and then this scene where he gets up and, you know, stands up on two legs and, um, like, like he's saying to the Roman soldier, ha, you didn't get me even with 40 lashes. And, see, that's all drama. You know, that didn't happen, okay? Um, <laughs> it was very painful. It's not like after that you could get up and, you know, say, yeah, give me some more, you know. Um, but there's a lot, a lot of Catholic sentiment around that kind of reason that Jesus atones for our sins. 
because he suffered so much for us. Okay? That plays a part in it, but that's not it. Okay? I mean, there's some Catholics I've heard, some saints, I think it was um, Catherine Emmerich, um, you know, just, just a drop of Christ's blood would be enough to atone for the whole world. Uh, no, to be quite frank with you. Okay, because what was required of Christ was not the suffering. That would be part of it. That would bring him to the brink. It was the death. So unless Christ died, there would be no atonement. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how many drops of blood were sprinkled on the way. Okay. Um, <clears throat> because if he lived after that suffering, there would be no atonement. So basically the suffering is, is only an artifact, sort of, of the real reason why he atones for our sins. And um, <clears throat> so you don't want to get into that mode of thinking. Okay. And that's a lot what Mel Gibson did in his movie, the sort of the Anne Catherick Emmerich view of the passion. And uh, she goes way off. Okay. And the scripture says over and over and over again that it is looking forward to the death of Christ, death of the body, you see. And it doesn't take, it doesn't make any difference how much suffering it takes to get there. That is the goal, the death. Okay. So um, now in another faulty way of thinking of this is that in the, the, on the ransom theory, that somehow the devil is owed something. Okay. And God has to pay the devil by taking the life of Christ. And in that payment, then there is um, a freedom given to the slaves that were under the devil. Okay. Uh, no, that is just, I, I, I am surprised that some of the early fathers even thought of this as an atonement. I don't know where they were getting these ideas. Of course, there were a lot of ideas floating around at that time. And it's amazing to me that the fathers were as orthodox as they were because of all the strange ideas that were floating around, okay? And this was one of them, the ransom theory. And um, you see, what that does is it makes it now a legal game wherein since since the devil got Adam to disobey God, then somehow there's a legal arrangement between God and the devil where God owes the devil something. Uh, or you could say that he that that somehow God and the devil have made an arrangement to go under the law because that's what a ransom is. A ransom is not like going to the judge and saying, okay, if I give the kidnapper a million dollars, uh, he promises to return my son, although he kidnapped him, and we're going to write it all up in a contract, you see. Um, no, it doesn't work that way. So a ransom is not a legal thing, um, but it's, it's still something that Scripture never really gets into and says, oh, yeah, this is the nature of the atonement. God owes the devil in a sort of an underhanded way, not a legal way, uh, just a personal way. And so he has to pay the devil with Christ's death. And then all these uh, people that were under the devil get released. Okay. And a lot of it has to do with the, with the, uh, with the Greek word that's used in a couple of places in the New Testament that is translated into ransom in English versions. And that was a mistake. Okay. Because even though there may be some kind of tit-for-tat, quid pro quo kind of arrangement, it doesn't mean ransom in the sense that, yeah, the, God has to give the devil something for the devil to give God something. Okay? <laughs> no. 
The devil has nothing to do with it. Okay, the devil's under judgment, and he's lucky God didn't destroy him, ipso facto, right off the bat. Instead, God's going to use the devil to see who else of the human race wants to side with him. And God will allow it, because he only wants the ones that are really going to be true blue. And what better way to test them out than let the devil come into their lives? Okay. So you, you see, man and the devil think they're winning somehow in the Garden of Eden. And God says, uh, no. See, I already knew this, and I have it all planned out why I'm going to allow you to live, and my plan will be accomplished. Okay, and I'm going to use you to do it. Whoever would have thunk of that? You see. So, <laughs> and then the uh, atonement, uh, the substitutionary atonement, that's the idea that Christ was our substitute on the cross. So when we say Christ died for my sins, um, what we're saying is that Christ paid the price, paid the penalty for my sins. So he's my substitute. That, you know, since he paid for it, uh, you know, I can go scot-free. And no, that is not the, the uh, understanding of it at all. Christ did not pay for our sins on the cross. Okay? As hard as that may seem to be from all the stuff you've heard. Okay? And the church never taught that idea. The one who taught that idea was John Calvin, for example. And the reason he, he had a good reason for it because it sort of fit into his theology. But the reason is that he didn't believe man had a free will to choose for God, that everything was planned from the eternity. God chose the people that he knew were going to be born, and uh, out of those, he chose his elect. And it was you know, non-discriminatory. It was just, I choose you, I choose you, and we don't have any reason... We, we have no criterion for why God chose the ones he chose. He just chose them arbitrarily, as far as we know, and because he gives us no reason, okay? If you don't believe in free will, then there is no reason. You just believe God arbitrarily chose them, which means that the one he didn't choose, the ones he didn't choose, um he arbitrarily did that as well because you can't be stupid enough to say, well, yeah, well, he only picked these, but he didn't say anything about these other ones. Oh, really? Like, you know, God's really stupid and he can't figure out that if I don't, if I choose these, then it doesn't mean that I'm not choosing these. No, it does mean that. It does mean that you're not choosing them for the same arbitrary reason that you picked these people. Okay. Uh, well, whatever the case, whatever the criteria was that God used in Calvin's mind, the fact is you have this elect people here who are going to be born in history, and they're going to be saved, and yet they're sinners, because they're all sinners in Adam. Okay, so how are you going to save them from their the, the punishment of their sin? Well, you get Christ to do it. Okay, so Christ, he really did pay for their sins. Here's the price. One billion, 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 whatever. <laughs> and Christ paid that. For all the billions or millions, whoever it's going to be that are going to be saved, there's going to be a price to pay. And then you add all that up and you get into the billion, 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 whatever it is. Uh, and Christ has to pay that. And so now the problem for Calvin was that when Christ went to the cross, okay, so before that, on the road to Calvary, or let's say even in the uh, praetorium, he's whipped by the soldiers, and, um, you know, that's pretty bad. And, and then um, he's, you know, he's hardly in shape to do anything, and they make him walk the, 
the way of the cross up up to Calvary and carrying his own cross. Okay, he suffered there. And then he gets on the cross and, you know, he's just about to die anyway. And they put the nails in and like they do with anybody else who goes on the cross in Roman history. And, you know, he bleeds to death like everybody else who would be in that situation does. And so he takes his last breath and he dies. Okay, so... Okay, yeah, that's, you know, I wouldn't want to do that. Um, and it's a traumatic experience to go through. But that doesn't seem like it's enough. You know, it's like, you mean, you, come on, we're talking about billions of people and all their sins, and you're saying that all he has to do is die on the cross? And that pays for everybody's sins? It seems like there's an imbalance here somewhere. Okay, I mean, because dying on the cross, although it's a big deal for the Son of God, I understand that, but any criminal who was convicted uh, was dying on the cross. They had, you know, 20,000 crucifixions at, at times for all the criminals that were waiting, and they were on death row, so to speak. I mean, the Romans were just vicious people. I mean, they... Geez. So, um, but it, but there seems to be a theological imbalance, nevertheless, between the paying for the billions of sins. Because what is what is it to pay for a sin? I mean, think about that. What would you have to do? Well, you know what God says? He says you're going to go to hell for eternity. Yeah, you commit one mortal sin, unrepentant mortal sin, and you're going to go to hell. That's the price. You want to know what the price is? That's the price. And you're never gonna you're never gonna come out. All right. So we have an idea of what God thinks of what the price is for sin. And yet you got these billions of people here that are Calvin's elect, and Christ is going to pay their sin, pay for their sin, and yet he only goes goes to the cross. Well, that's not hell. As a matter of fact, he, he's out of there in three days. Now, somebody might come back and say, well, yeah, but since Christ did it, it's an infinite um, uh, price. Uh, no. <laughs> no. You just See, we, we like to throw the word infinity around a lot, we, especially Catholics. Oh, this is infinite. That's it. God's infinite. This, the, the sacrifice is infinite. And you know what? Infinite doesn't have a meaning. Because it's never ending. You can't pin it down and say, oh, this is the meaning of infinite. In other words, it fulfills itself. In other words, the meaning is infinite, so you can't really define what it is. Okay? So, but we like to throw that word around because it sounds so superlative, you see. But um, no, it wasn't. Okay, even the death of, of Christ, the God man. Okay, it's not infinite. I don't know what mathematics has to do with sacrifice. Okay. Um <laughs> so, so Calvin made up for this because he saw, yeah, there is a little imbalance there. And so he said that the punishment that Christ paid started in the Garden of Gethsemane. When Jesus is um, praying and he's just beside himself, literally, with fear and anguish, I mean, these are some of the words that Luke and Mark and Matthew use. They're just amazing, the words they use to describe the state that Christ is in. And, um, and, and Luke says he's pouring uh, out blood, uh, or he's pouring sweat out like great drops of blood. Now, that's a metaphor there, but there's still a good chance that the sweat is red because he's so, under so much anguish, and there's a condition, I forget what the name of it is, a medical condition, where you can be in such anguish that your sweat actually, you know, the, the, the uh, water in your body actually starts to mix with the capillaries, you know, because you have arteries and veins, and between them you have capillaries, and that's the thinnest part 
where you can um, act, the blood could actually spill out from the capillaries because they're very small and they run close to some of the uh, you know water pathways in the body and under extreme anguish that could happen where you could you know actually sweat blood okay uh, so Calvin takes this and says you see that's where it all started that's where the hell is. That's where hell began. You see, because Calvin said that the price for sin is hell. Okay. And even that has its problems because, all right, say Christ went to hell. Does that pay for billions of people's sins or just one or two? You know, how do you calculate all this? I mean, you got to be a mathematician with an algebraic equation to figure you know, how much is this worth here? Okay. I mean, I, I've heard Catholic theologians argue about this with the sacrifice of the mass. You know, is one mass good or is 10 good? Or shall we do 50 masses? How does God calculate all this out? Do we, do we have to have a mathematical board to figure out, you know, and, and you, you can see how it begins to detract actually from the whole reason of sacrifice, which I'm going to get to in a minute. And that's because it's personal. See, math is not personal. Math is math. So that's why when you say, oh, it's infinite, that doesn't mean anything. Okay. Now, when you talk about the person of God, because he is a person, he's one person of the Trinity. Or are you talking about the person of Christ? Well, that's different. Now you're getting personal. Okay. And that's what makes the atonement the atonement, which I'll get to in a second. But I just want to tell you why this penal substitution is not going to work. Okay. It's not going to work. Because the atonement is not a mathematical calculation that requires a commensurate punishment to take care of the mathematical tally of the sins that have accumulated. You see, that's not what Scripture is talking about. That may be what you're talking about in a court of law. You know, I'm going to give you 10 years because you, you know, attempted to kill this person. And if we find out that, you know, you actually did it deliberately with, Malice of forethought, as the saying goes, you'll be either 25 to life or even I give you three lifetimes. So there's a tit for tat, quid quo pro, you see. But that's not what the atonement's about. That's why it's not a penal substitution. Because this is the road you will go down. You will go down the same road Calvin road went down. And he got all tangled up by trying to find the right atonement to of hell that Christ had to suffer to pay for all these sins. And he ain't going to find it. Because Christ didn't go to hell. Okay? Well, at least he didn't go to hell to pay for the sins. We will find out what that all means. Because our, our Apostles' Creed says, and Christ descended into hell. What does that mean? Well, it didn't mean he paid for the punishment. But that's what Calvin did with that. Well, the Apostles' Creed. He says, see, it says it right there in the creed. Christ descended into hell. And then he rose from the dead. And what's in between? The, the uh, uh, you know, the soldiers coming for him and him rising from the dead? He went to Gethsemane. So that's where Calvin's figuring out, oh, yeah, that's where hell is. That's what it means he descended into hell. You see? <laughs> because he has to find a place, a time where Christ can can go to hell and make up for all these sins. That's just assuming that he can make up for billions of sins. Okay, he doesn't even know that either. As I said. So that ain't going to work. All right. What works is the here's here's the thing. First of all, in under, to understand what the atonement is, you have to understand who God is. Okay, why does God want someone to suffer and die to make up for 
these other people who have sinned and um, can't make up for it themselves. What is it? I mean, what is it about the father that requires his own son free of sin? And it could have been somebody else. If there was any man that was free of sin and had the guarantee of not sinning, maybe God could have used him. But there was none, obviously, because they're all under the sin of Adam. So the only way this is going to happen is if God himself becomes a man, a sinless man, so that he can offer a sacrifice to the Father, and the Father will be moved in such a way where he says, okay, what Adam did to you, you're going to suffer some remnants of that. But at least now you have the possibility to get out from under it totally if you do what he was supposed to do. I'm going to give you that opportunity. Okay? Your father failed. Adam failed. You're going to do the same thing that he was required to do. And it's going to be the rest of your life. Not just one little test in the Garden of Eden. You see? Because I'm not going to go through that again. Okay? Yeah, you remember right after Adam, a few generations down the pike, it was so bad that I had to create a flood to kill them all? Yeah. So I'm not going to go through that again. You're going to prove to me that you really want to be in my kingdom, that you hate evil like I do, okay? That you're going to conform yourself to my image, come hell or high water, okay? And you're going to prove that to me for the rest of your life, okay? And hopefully you pass. Because I'm not going to make it that hard on you. I'm going to give you, and if it is hard, it's, you're going to have the grace to go through it all. Okay? But I'm not going to go through the Garden of Eden again. And I'm not going to go through the flood again. The only time that's going to happen is at the end of the world. Okay? When I've had enough, and it's all done, and everybody who's going to be saved is saved, and everybody who is not saved is going to remain that way, and that's it. It's over. Okay, so so what am I saying? It, it takes a lot to move me. Okay, grace is not cheap. Because if you make grace cheap, it means nothing. It's like, you know, the Pope forgiving Judas. That's cheap grace. He had, he had to do nothing. God, God's just forgiving, you see. No, no, God is not just forgiving, okay? He wants to forgive. He is overbound with forgiveness in that sense, but it's not cheap grace, okay? So, and so let's go back to that question. Who is God? Who is God? Is he some kind of mechanical robot in the sky, some force? Um, you know, and this is where I don't like Thomas's understanding of God. He's just some kind of um, um, cause and effect. Everything's cause and effect, and and um, God just moves through through things logically and with the intellect and all this stuff. Is that all God is? No. No, that's not what Scripture tells us. God has love, compassion pity he sings with us as Zephaniah says he um, bends over backwards for us he pleads with us he has sorrow after we don't listen to him I mean this is the description throughout the Old and New Testament that we have of this God so who is he he's a very personal being it's not just intellect and will, okay, as if God has to calculate everything out and, and has no skin in the game, so to speak, no emotion about it, no, 
well, if it doesn't turn out, that's okay. I don't care. You know, no. <laughs> that's just the opposite of what Scripture tells us. For example, in the flood, God says, hey, you know what? I am, I, I am so distraught over the sin of man. I am sorry I made him. And the word sorry there is the strongest Hebrew sorry you can say. Okay? Wow. That's the kind of God we have. And so if you have that kind of God, how is he affected by our sin? Well, it becomes very personal. Very personal. Because you have personally attacked him. You see, it's not just like, oh, well, the St. Janus guy sinned. All right, beep, write that down, beep, write that down. And like God's saying, you know, gee, I wonder when he's going to stop. No, I personally offended God. See, I'm made in his image. I'm supposed to do as he does. And I did just the opposite. And so he's personally offended. Okay, because he is a person. That's why we say three persons. What does that mean? That means three personalities. Yes, all the thing that we associate with personality as humans, that's what God is, only perfect. And even feeling it more, much more intensely than we do. Okay. So you can imagine how he felt when he says, I'm sorry I made man right before the flood. And God can't lie. You can't like say, well, you know, kind of in the dumps about this mankind thing, you know, maybe if I had to redo it, I wouldn't do it. Who knows? No, he just comes right out and tells us. Sorry, I made you. Okay. Now you either take that at face value. Or you're going to end up making excuses for Scripture. Well, I learned a long time ago, you don't make excuses for Scripture because you're not going to survive. Okay? Scripture means what it means. And um, so we're finding out about this God, who this God is, that Christ has to offer a sacrifice to. And here's another way to look at it. Some of the fathers and the medievals did this as well. Um, and that is God is a, um, he's the highest that we're ever going to even contemplate of a being could be the highest. Okay. And that means he has honor as that being honor. And we forget that in society today. We don't even know what honor is anymore. Okay. We've got these teenagers running around doing things. They just don't honor their parents anymore, and they don't have the fir first clue what it is. Um, but old society used to know what honor was. And when you sin against God, you besmirch his honor. Okay? You besmirch his honor. And in order to, for God to turn to you and offer you forgiveness for that, what does it take for God to make that turn? You see, because you've offended him personally, and he has every right to destroy you. What's going to make him turn his face towards you and say, I can forgive you? Just willy-nilly? You see, and that's where people go wrong a lot. It's not willy-nilly. It takes a lot to turn this mighty being who has honor galore around where he now says, I can forgive you. What does it take? It takes a sacrifice like his son did on the cross and offers his life in order to turn the father around 
to take a second look at us. Okay? That's what it takes. And God says, that's all I'm going to accept. Okay? I don't want him, any man coming there, you know, offering me sacrifices because, you know what? I got to hold my nose as you offer your sacrifice. <coughs> Your sins are so stinking many, I can't stay in the sight of you. And you're going to offer me a sacrifice? I don't think so. I want a pure, sinless man who obeys me to the letter, who loves me, who sees my design for the universe, who knows all about me and my personal quirks about when I see men sin and wants to appease that. <clears throat> wants to do whatever he can to make up for this total breach of trust, love, <clears throat> and beneficence. Because that's what Adam did in the garden. A total turning of his back against God. Wherein he said, you know what? <sighs> this obeying God stuff, I don't think I'm going to be able to live with that. So, you know, hey, I'm going to take the devil's opportunity here, become my own God. That way I can make my own rules. I don't have to serve this being over here. That's a total <laughs> turning around from where you should be. Okay? That's an insult. Total, absolute insult to God. As well as besmirching his honor. Because there's no there's nobody greater. No one. Not even coming close. Okay? So, and for me to turn around to you, and say, okay, well, that's all right. You know, we'll we'll figure it out somehow and make it better. Uh, no. <laughs> no. God says, there's only one thing I will accept. And I'll give it to you as a gift. But this is it. And if you don't obey this, there's no chance for you. You... It's not, and it's not just like, you know, me and you will separate ways. You know, you go your way, I'll go my way because it didn't work out. No, baby, you're going to hell and you're going to suffer in punishment, hell. And you're never going to see me again. See, that's how high up God is. He can say these things because he's so far above us. Okay. Okay. <laughs> And he just gives us the, the ability to talk about it. And to talk about it's enough. It's like overwhelming. Who is this God? You see. And so the guy says here, there's only one way. It's going to have he's, this guy, this man's going to die. And he better be a perfect sacrifice. And then. It's not to pay for your sins, okay? Because I'm not going to send Christ to hell to pay for your sins, okay? He's got to do something for me because I'm the father. I'm the guy who's behind it all. And Christ was begotten. The Holy Spirit proceeded. But I'm the guy behind it all, okay? So, uh, yeah, you're going to have to do something for me. To restore my honor, to take away the insult, to uh, appease my wrath, which I could do in a second, okay? And that's all I'm going to accept, this God-man dying on the cross. That's how personal it is for me, you see. And then, as I said, we're not paying for your sins. Okay, not at all. 
I will forgive you for your sins and won't send you to hell to pay the punishment for them because I am a benevolent father who wants his children to come back to him. Okay? So forget about the punishment. The only time you're going to get the punishment is if you don't follow the path that I'm giving you. Okay? That's what the forgiveness does for you. But nobody paid for anything. You know why? Because look, first of all, you couldn't you couldn't figure out a payment high enough to pay for all those billions of people and their billions of sins. Okay? And that's not the way we work it. As a matter of fact, if Christ paid for your sins, then nobody, including Judas, Judas Iscariot, should go to hell. And the Pope's right. <laughs> okay? Because once the sins are paid for, God can't come back and say, uh, yeah, the sins are paid for, but, you know, it wasn't enough. You're going to have to pay for them, too. So you're going to have to go to hell. No. See, if you have a legal arrangement like that, a penal substitution, and this is why you don't want a legal arrangement. The legal arrangement says if he paid for my sins, then there can't be double jeopardy. You can't pay for the sins twice, no matter who it is. Okay? Well, that's not the kind of atonement that God gave us. The kind of atonement he gave us was, okay, I'll accept the sacrifice that repairs my honor, appeases the insult, um, and so now I'll give you the same chance Adam had in the Garden of Eden. But there's still some things that are going to change. It's not going to be a pristine garden, number one. And as a punishment for Adam's sin, the whole human race is going to have this thing called concupiscence. Called, and it's what we define theologically as the proclivity to sin. Okay? And nobody's going to, uh, no angels are going to be around if you happen to stub your toe to prevent you from stubbing your toe, or if you fall off a cliff, or you get into a car accident. All that's gone. It's all gone. And there's only going to be special times where I send my angels to protect you. And they're going to be rare. Okay? So these are the things that you're going to suffer because of what your father did. But you still have the chance to do what he didn't do. And that's all because we have an atonement given by Christ the God-man to God the Father that made the Father turn around once again to look at us and say, what can be done to salvage mankind? Here it is. I just described it for you. And you'll understand that's the Catholic understanding of the atonement. Those theologians that know about it, okay? And because um, it ain't penal substitution and it ain't a ransom theory, okay? And there's a couple other... Um, theories, but they're offshoots of the other ones. All right. Sorry to spend so much time on that, but that was an important question, especially since Easter has just come and gone. Why do some animals live only in certain places, whereas their common original homeland is Armenia? And why do we not find their fossils across the trails of their migrations? All right. Um, uh, their common original homeland would be where the Ark settled on Mount Ararat in Turkey. And um, that's, that's their common meeting point. So I'm, I don't know where you're getting, unless you're saying that Armenia is the, sort of the general area where the ark landed um, but the scripture doesn't say armenia it says the mountains of ararat but i mean i'll take it if you're <clears throat> if you're associating armenia with that general area that's that's fine so uh, we explained this last week okay so i'm gonna have to go through it again 
but um so you have all the sort of first edition of animals in the ark including dinosaurs baby dinosaurs and you only need one pair okay um so <laughs> and then after a year's growth they're ready to get out of the ark okay so what you find this is like dogs you can you get one pair of dogs and you can have all these other species of dogs that you know from a greyhound to a chihuahua from this one pair of dogs that's what the dna does for us and it does it rather fast okay there's a lot of variation put into DNA. Um, so um, what happens is with the landmass is as the flood came up, what happened was this one continent or one landmass called Pangaea, okay? Um, it already had cracks in it, so rivers and lakes could be formed. Um, but during the flood time, those cracks separated. They call them fissures. And the water that was stored down under the earth now had the capability of rising up through those cracks in the crust. And there would be so, so much pressure <clears throat> from underneath the crust that the water would rise um, hundreds of feet into the atmosphere and just dilute the atmosphere with water vapor. And that's why it rained for 40 days. Okay. Because the clouds as they stand now don't have enough water to last even, you know, a week or two. All right. But it, it did rain for 40 days. And, Um, as the fissures became, so the, the fissures, the cracks became greater. Okay. So they separated and they kept on separating. Okay. Slowly. All right. But they kept on set and they would do that for thousands of years into the future. Okay. Because you're considering land masses now that are you know, billions of pounds of earth that are moving all at once. You know how much momentum that is? Okay. I mean, you know how hard it would be to stop a moving train. Okay. They have to put their brakes on miles away because of the momentum of that train with all of the produce that it is carrying and the engines that are tons they have to put the brakes on miles away so that they can stop in time when they reach the station. Okay. That's because of momentum. It's a physical law. So once these cracks occur and the land masses start to move, they have tremendous momentum. And that momentum cannot be stopped unless there is a, an external force that stops them. And most of that's going to be friction. Okay. But um, friction, yeah, it works, but it takes a while. And so these land masses are going to separate. So by the time Noah gets out of the ark in a year's time, okay, the masses haven't gone very far. They just went far enough, the land masses, that is. They went far enough where the water can shoot out and go up hundreds of feet and make it rain and flood the whole land, okay? And that's it. So by the time the year is up, they're relatively close together, okay? And so the land animals can come up and the bears can go to the north and the the um, the uh, kangaroos can go to the south in this little Armenian area, so to speak. Um, depending on how big a cut a swath of land you're talking about there. And, um, you know, the lions can go in the middle part and the um, antelope can go northwest or northeast. And, you know, you're going to get land animals that are going to move in all kinds of directions. 
Okay, and they're all going to want to get away from each other because they they want to preserve their own, and um, <clears throat> they're they're not they're not the animals are not very good about conglomerating together unless they're peaceful animals, you know, veg vegetarians. Okay, but we got a lot of meat eaters there, so um, and everybody's got to watch out, and they are, they're going to look for the warmer places or the colder places. You know, the bears don't like it when it's really hot. They go up where it's cold, and then they'll hibernate in the winter. And uh, so you have particular characteristics of each animal, and they're going to go in the direction that best suits that. Meanwhile, the crusts that have separated are still separating, okay? Uh, I don't know how many feet per second they're separating, but they're still separating. And so if the, can if the uh, kangaroos went south right after they got out of the ark, well, that land mass is going to carry them south, okay? If the, if the um, tigers and the lions st stood in the equator part of the area, well, that's where they're going to be found, and that's where we find them generally. Okay, and then the other animals, you know, the bears go north, and the, the land mass is shifting then, and that's where the, we find a lot of bears, and, uh, and and so on and so on. Okay, so and the land masses are still moving today, believe it or not, very slowly. You know, maybe um, a couple of millimeters a day, and uh, so you can't detect it, but. You know, the momentum is still there, okay? So that's how he would answer how the animals got to where they, 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 they are today. And, um, you know, even the moon is moving away four centimeters a year, okay? So, <laughs> yeah, we can calculate that out. So, um, and that's because, look, this whole universe is built to last for a specific amount of time okay and and then it's over six thousand seven thousand years and this clock is over okay and we have to keep that in mind whenever we're talking about you know what god did and even then even then if it only lasts six or seven thousand years it's built very precisely so that it works during that six or seven thousand years because let's say for example um the universe that rotates in sidereal time 23 hours 56 minutes 4.09 seconds every single day without fail if that were to slow down at all okay so that um you know, it's 24 out, four hours, 25 hours, 26 hours. Life would not last on Earth. Okay. Because what would happen was the one side of the hemisphere of the Earth would get too much heat and it would start to dry up things and the water would evaporate and it would go. Okay. So that has to be very precise. And that's why, as a matter of fact, we say, that it's much better to have the universe go around a fixed Earth than the Earth to be rotating in a fixed universe. Why? Well, because the Earth is bombarded every single day by external and internal forces. That slows it down. Okay? Or that would slow it down. Even the evolutionists believe this. They believe the Earth used to rotate once in 10 hours. And over time, it, it got slower and slower. So now that it, it takes near, near 24 hours. Okay. Well, let's just extrapolate on that. I mean, every time there is an earthquake or a tsunami or a volcano or every time somebody builds a big skyscraper, the Earth should slow down if it's rotating. And we should be able to detect that and measure it. Okay. Not just the microns that you see in the news all the time. Okay. Um, it should slow down significantly. Like Venus has or Saturn has. Okay. Uh, so any kind of movement of the Earth's crust, whatever. A tidal shifts every day. We have two tides. 
come on, man. I mean, think about it. <laughs> this. This is a massive movement of water. And you're saying it doesn't affect the rotation of the Earth? Okay. And, there, and, and for earthquakes, there's a million earthquakes every year around the world. You add those all up. You know, they might be in the two to three Richter range, but you add them all up. You got some significant movement there. Okay. Um, so if that's a kind of instability that a single earth would have that we want it to rotate and keep that time because we know that if that time changes all life on earth could dissipate it's much better to have the universe going around a fixed earth because this massive universe has a momentum that nothing can stop once you give it one push it's going to continue to rotate with that angular momentum Odd infinitum. Nothing can stop it, internally or externally. Okay? So, um, <laughs> there's no comparison. And then you got the, the, per, the gravitational perturbations of the planets all affecting Earth. Okay? Asteroids, meteors, Cosmic um, disturbances, cosmic rays, gravity of the moon, gravity of the sun. Um, yeah, it's, it's, the Earth just has a lot coming after it. Okay, so I, I just wanted to get that in there because we were talking about you know Earth movements and stuff. Um, and as far as water under the crust of the Earth, they have found, and we we put this into our movie, they have found. There is four times as much water under the crust and into the mantle than there is in the oceans. Four times the amount of water that are in the oceans. Okay? So some people say, well, there wouldn't be enough water there for a worldwide flood. Oh, yes, there would be. Okay? And um, we have the uh, scientific studies to prove it. Okay, let's move on. Uh, what is the difference between the world as an enemy of the soul and the world as the place in which we live? Um, well, like Jesus said, you know, I mean, you're of the world in the sense that you live here, but do not be conformed to the world. Okay. Um, You know, this is like we said, this is this is the punishment for Adam's sin. We're living in a world that sometimes is more like hell than heaven. Uh, and we're told by Jesus, my kingdom is not of this world. And so we're limited to what we can do to improve it. Um, and so we're going to suffer. From the day you're born to the day you die, you're going to be suffering. And a lot has to do with how this earth, this world, and all its mentality works. Okay. Um, and you can get mixed up with that world, thinking that, you know, in order to get anywhere in the world, so to speak, I have to do this and this and this. I have to con conform the way that the church or the, uh, the world tells me to do it politically or financially or all this stuff. And that's how the world bombards you. And it's hard to escape. Okay. Hard to escape. That's why we had people running off to, into monasteries and the nunneries, and they just couldn't take it. Okay. They, they loved God. They wanted to serve God. And the only place they could find to do it was some vacuum out there in the desert uh, that, you know, they could live off the land or whatever and, and bide their time and take their suffering. And then, Glory, hallelujah, they die and go to heaven. Um, sometimes when you think about the reality of this world, it's hard to take. It's hard to take. And there's no place to go that you can escape it. Because if you go from point A to point B, what do you think is going to be at point B? The same stuff that was at point A. And it might be, uh, you know, greater, the same, less, but it's still there. Okay. And, you know, so, 
Oh, boy. I, I, I hope I answered your question. Uh, can the devil and false prophets perform miracles? What is the limit of their capabilities? Yes, we call it preternatural. That is, they can take anything that's already created and conform it to their wishes uh, um, in, in the sense that when we see it, we see something that it wasn't before. Okay? They can't create anything. <clears throat> they can only use what's already there and distort it to a point where you're thinking you're seeing something. Okay? Now, they have their little ways of doing that. I don't know. I can't give you any details of that. But, that, you know, like, say, uh, in, back in Moses' time, um, Moses, um, uh, the, the magicians wanted to mimic Moses. And so what they did was they, um, they made um, um, serpents that looked like serpents um, out of um, um, sticks. And, um, you know, as a challenge to Moses, okay, the uh, witch of Endor uh, made it appear as if uh, she was bringing Samuel up from the dead, okay, to talk to Saul. Um, you know, so they have those capabilities, um, but we call them preternatural because they can't create anything themselves, Okay. So, yes, false prophets can perform miracles, okay? Um, but usually it's of the variety where it's deceptive, illusions. They don't raise people from the dead, so to speak, okay? Because they can't do that. That's creation. Uh, so they may be able to um, make it look like somebody has risen from the dead by animating the body with their devilish spirits. You know, they could do that much. So in that sense, we think that's a miracle, but it's, you know, preternatural ability is what it is. When the Bible talks about miracles, these are things that the devil can't imitate on the same level that God had made them through the prophets. Um, you know, actually raising people from the dead, which Peter and Paul did. Um, putting limbs back on people. Curing blind people so that they can see. Uh, you know, all those kinds of things. You don't find the devil doing those kinds of, of uh, activities. Okay? Because they're what they call genuine divine miracles. And they get that status because of the tremendous alteration of nature that has just taken place. Okay. All right. Was it Jesus, Son of God, in the garden dealing with Adam? Was it Jesus, the Son of God, in the garden dealing with Adam, dealing with Moses, Joshua, etc., throughout the Old Testament? Um, well, no, we can't say that, okay? Um, because he, the Old Testament does not make that distinction for us, okay? It only refers to God as, you know, Yahweh, Elohim, El Shaddai, you know, and it does not get into um, the second person of the Trinity, okay? except in very special but somewhat obscure passages of Scripture, like Isaiah 7, verse 14, okay? And then it's only a prophecy about his coming. It's not saying that holy, the, that the second person of the Trinity is distinguished in the Old Testament, okay? That doesn't mean he's not working in the Old Testament, okay? Because we have some passages in the New Testament that say, like 1 Corinthians 10, 4, uh, it says, and they all followed the rock. This is in the desert. So there's this rolling rock, okay? <laughs> and they're following it. Okay, they, they have the pillar of fire by night and the rolling rock 
by day, and they wherever the rock goes, they follow it. Okay, and um, and it says, and that rock was Christ. Now, isn't that interesting? That rock was Christ. Now, it's a little difficult to interpret that, okay, because um, we have a hard time associating rocks with Christ, inanimate rocks, all right? And what we would say is that Christ is moving the rock, okay? And that's what the people are following. But because Christ is the only one that can move it, obviously the Israelites know that only God can move it. But they weren't given that information, that it was Christ who was moving the rock, as opposed to the Father and the Son. Although in Catholic theology, sometimes we say, well, we, we mean it all the time, that whatever the Father does, the Son and the Holy Spirit are involved Whatever the Son does, the Father and the Holy Spirit are involved in, you know, same with the Holy Spirit, okay? And where we're going to make those distinctions as to when one person of the Trinity does something and the other two are not, uh, there is, you know, it's a little tricky. And, and uh, so when Scripture says it, we have more inclination at that time to separate the persons and say, okay, Christ did this, whereas the Holy Spirit inspired Isaiah to um, talk about his uh, seeing God on the throne in Isaiah 6. That's not, the, that's not Christ's job to inspire the, the uh, prophet Isaiah. Okay, It was Christ's job to move the rock. All right. So, um, and then you have like uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 to 12, I think it is where it talks about the Old Testament prophets writing, and it says, seeking to understand the, the Christ who was to come. And that's before Christ came. These are the Old Testament prophets. So they knew Christ, Christos, Greek Christos, okay, um, um, was coming. Christ. Uh, and and so you see, you have these lot of a lot of indications in the Old Testament that they knew the Trinity existed. So all this talk, Jewish talk about, you know, there was just one God, and there couldn't be a Jesus Christ or the Holy Spirit. No, not in the Old Testament. Okay, now it was disguised in the Old Testament. Okay, but you get glimpses here and there that um, Christ is active in the Old Testament. We just have to be very careful what we apply to him. Okay. So you have um, three persons in one God in the Old Testament, just like the New. That we can safely say. The distinguishing of the persons of the Trinity isn't made as clear in the Old Testament as it is in the New. Okay. And, um, you know, God has his reasons for that. All right. Okay, let me see. Where are we here? Why is ruar in Hebrew a feminine word? I, you're going to have to give me some context on that one there, Leonardo. Tell me where, what passage you're looking at, and um, then I can examine it for you. All right. So I'll have to pass on your question. Uh, question, how to prove to somebody that evolution is false, even though they hold it as a dogma because of the omnipresent propaganda, assuming they are open-minded. Um, today, it's very hard to do that. Okay, today, people think of science like the real God. Men are their God. They worship the men who teach science, you know. They got these fancy equations, and they go way back in time, and all that stuff. You know, that never used to happen before, before the the um, Enlightenment period. I mean, you got Plato and Aristotle and some of the Greeks, but you know, 
they're all over the place. And everybody's got an idea because nobody can prove anything. All right. Well, today they think they can prove certain things, you see. Um, you know, like you talk to Stephen Gould, who was the uh, premier evolutionist before he died in, what, 1998 from Harvard, Stephen Gould. He said, well, evolution is not a theory. It's a fact. It's a fact. You see? So they are so convinced of their own propaganda that they think evolution is a fact. And in science, a lot of times, it all depends on from where you start your argument. If your preposition, pre presupposition is that evolution is true, it's a fact. And all evolutionists I know start from that presupposition. You know, they don't go into it and say, gee, I wonder... If all the evidence adds up to, you know, us evolving from monkeys and they don't do that. They go into it saying, this is true. Now let me see what I can do to prove it's true. And so every piece of evidence they get, whether it's fossil specimens or radioactive isotopes or it doesn't matter. They're going to put that all through the grid the, and here's the grid, and it says evolution is a fact. So they're going to put all that evidence, all that data through the grid, and what do you think is going to come out the other side? Yeah. Fossils prove evolution. Radioactive isotopes prove evolution. Okay? That's what you're going to get. You know, if I find a bone a skull over here, well, uh, that's, you know, we'll call him Peking man, and that proves evolution. Okay? So, this is what you're up against today. They've already declared it a fact. So, you're going to come in the door, and you're going to say, what? Well, you have to attack the fact. You have to attack the presupposition. And you say, look, first of all, science doesn't work that way, Mr. Genius. Science comes in and says, here, we found all this empirical evidence. What are we going to do with it? Well, let's hypothesize what we think it's from. Let's make a theory, possibly, from where we think it came from and what it all means. And that's how we proceed. And then we may find more evidence, less evidence. Somebody may come along and say, hey, your theory doesn't work because of this and this. And we have to take a look at that. And, you know, that's the way science proceeds. But see, what they have done is they have made science into a god, where science now establishes itself as saying that evolution is a fact. The Big Bang is a fact, not a theory anymore. Okay? That's what we're up against. And so, it, like with the Big Bang, um, when when the, the universe that you proposed with the Big Bang doesn't work like it you thought it was supposed to work. And, and so what do you do? Well, you don't dissolve the Big Bang, you see, but that's because it's true. The Big Bang is a fact. Okay? It's a fact. Don't argue with that. We're not going there with you. And so when we don't have all the ingredients that we should have to make it work, well, what do we do? Well, we just make them up. We say, well, we, we should have dark matter. We should have dark energy. We should have superluminal expansion. Okay. Uh, we should have galaxy rotation 10 times more than what Newton offers us. All this stuff. So that's where we are today. It's hard to fight that, especially when they control the universities, all the, the governmental grants. Uh, all the foundational money, okay? We, we can't do anything, all right? All we can do is get behind our YouTube channel and start telling the, the people, whoever's, you know, three or four are out there listening, that it's all upside down from what it should be, okay? I mean, it's, it's it, I hate to laugh, but it is comical. 
how how totally one sided the information output is today uh, compared to what it used to be, you know, 500 years ago or, you know, 250 years ago. The avenues of communication have just been almost totally taken over by the agnostics, the atheists, and we hardly have a voice. Okay. And so good luck, you know, you can give these guys all the data and you, you, you and all, you know, everything that is against, and I've been doing it my whole life. Um, and you may get one out of a hundred that'll listen to you. Maybe one out of 50 on a good week. You might have, you know, you know, one out of 20. <laughs> so be prepared. Okay. You are totally outnumbered in this world. All you can do is find out what the truth is. Tell it to your children. Hope they tell it to their grandchildren and to a few friends and relatives you may have who, who probably think you're nuts anyway. Uh, and, you know, take your chances. All right. Dear Robert, Aiken constantly spews blasphemies, and this week he had the nerve to deny God's one-time commands against the specific Canaanite tribes of the time and Amalekites. Will you debate him soon? <laughs> Now, Jimmy has already said that he will not debate me. He said that loud and clear to somebody who asked him that question point blank. And he goes, what are you trying to get me to debate some genus? And he said, that's not going to happen. Okay. And we got him on tape saying that. So, uh, so Jimmy, Jimmy, I, I don't know. I like him, you know, because I, I, he wouldn't hurt a fly, but, but sometimes he just gets off on some of these things and he just thinks he's got the right answer every time and you know he's still he's still searching for bigfoot from what i understand so i don't know it's, it, i mean what are you going to do the guy won't even talk to me so i you know there's there's nothing i can do for him i sent him a two-hour video i made against him and um the other guy that works at uh, catholic answers um horn i forget his first name um they were saying stuff about you know creationism is all bunk and it has to be evolution and so i made a two-hour video critiquing their videos so i let them speak their you know like i usually make my videos you speak your piece i'll critique it okay I used to have a professor in seminary. He says, you read the scripture, I'll exegete it. <laughs> well, that was funny. Um, so I made the I sent it to him like two months ago. I, I didn't hear a word like, hey, thanks, Robert, for your, your uh, taking the time to go through all that I said about evolution and blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm sorry we don't disagree, but, you know, I respect you for your opinion and thank you for sending nothing. Didn't get a word. All right. So uh, um, I, I live. All I can tell you is I've tried. I've tried every way I can think of and nothing works. So I give up. Uh, question one, before the fall of Adam and Eve lived in the preternatural state. Uh, well, I, I, I question that, um, Suzanne, because I don't know exactly what you mean by preternatural. That's usually a term that we associate with the demonic world, that they have preternatural power. Okay, so <clears throat> since there was no death, how would this unfold? Would they populate the earth in infinitely? Would there be room? Now, what would happen probably... It's all, you know, theological speculation, but sometimes that can be, you know, reliable to at least a certain point. Is um, they would 
produce, increase and multiply, as God said in Genesis 1, 26 and 27 and 28. And they would populate the earth, okay? There would be no death. And we get to the point where um, there would be sufficient people on the earth and it couldn't take any more, basically. And um, whatever that number is, okay, um, then there would be a consummation. There would be an end, okay? So, in other words, the world would end. God would take all those beings to heaven, and they would live in the heavenly kingdom with that number of people with God for eternity, okay? So, um, that's the way we would look at it. All right. Uh, how do we explain the so-called contradictions between Genesis 1 and 2? Is there anywhere I can read about this from you? Yes. You just happen to come to the right place. <laughs> so we got a commentary out on Genesis 1 to 11, okay, uh, called Genesis 1 to 11. Uh, and you can buy that on robertsongenis.org, okay? We also have... Um, Um, we have, um, the, uh, new DVDs. Okay. Let me get them in case you haven't seen them yet. So here is day two. Okay. Um, how the world was made in six days, day two, hour and a half long. And then we have, and, and I, do we explain that question in here? No, we do it in day three. Yeah. Which is being made right now. Um, but you can read it in my Genesis commentary. And um, I do have another book out called Scientific Heresies. I think it's in there as well. But let me just tell you one thing that they think is a you know a contradiction. Um, you know, Genesis 2 says that um, man was made before the plants. Genesis 1 says the plants were made before man. So what's the deal? Well, obviously, there's not going to be a contradiction. I mean, can you imagine God writing scripture through Moses and making such a tremendous, obvious, um, incontrovertible error where one page says the plants are made before Adam, a man, and the next one says just the opposite? Okay. I mean, think about it, really. If that was true, then I wouldn't even turn the page to read Genesis chapter 3. Okay? I would say, forget about it. If this thing can't be trusted on every single page, then don't bother reading it. If there's one mistake... That can be proven as a mistake, not a textual difficulty, not a contextual difficulty um, or anything else, but it can be proven as an actual error. Don't read the rest of it. Okay? That's my advice. That's why I've never stopped reading it. Okay? Because there are no errors. It's like, take Genesis 1, for example. Uh, with the uh, creation of the light. God said, let there be light, and there was light. All right, and, but then on day four, you have the sun created. Okay, so people look at that and they go, obvious error, obvious. You know, they're writing for some other reason, literary reason, not scientific. Because how can you have a light for three days 
and then the sun coming and taking over and the lights never heard from again. I mean, why, why, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, well, it doesn't make sense to you because you don't know how Genesis was written. But this is what people will do. They will see something that looks like a contradiction. Okay. And just assume that, you know, without doing any more study on it, without doing any more work, and there's Catholic theologians who've done this. Stanley Yaki was famous for this from Seton Hall. Oh, that sun, man, that gives those Bible thumpers a real problem. Because why would you have the sun come after four days when the light was there for three days? And why is one replacing the other? Doesn't make sense. Yeah, well, that's because Stanley never really got into the scripture, never really believed scripture. He only believed what he wanted to believe. Okay, but the way I see it is, look, it's either all true or it's all false. There's no in between. Even for the cafeteria Catholic, there's no in between. Okay, that's why I said, if you find one thing you can prove is wrong, is a contradiction, I'm not going to read the rest of it. Okay, it's just a fact. It's it. This is an all or nothing game, as I keep saying, all or nothing. And uh, and God, as great as he is, I'm going to hold him to it. It's either all or nothing. Okay? If you say your scripture is inerrant, then I don't expect to find one single thing that's wrong with it. Not one single. And if I do, goodbye. Okay? That's that's how serious this whole thing is. All or nothing. So imagine, you know, I'm writing scripture. I'm, I'm Moses and I'm writing scripture. And I had this idea. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's make this light for three days. But it's not the sun. And then we'll make the sun on the fourth day. And, you know, we still see the sun today, so we know that's got to be true. But let me let me just make this up, this, this one light. Because I want to hear God say, and there was light. <laughs> and um, if the guy, if Moses is trying to convince his reader that he has the superior advantage in writing this way and he he um wants to win over his audience by giving the most logical um and factual account of what happened why would he ever concoct such a fantasy where you create a light for three days, then it disappears and the sun takes over and does the same thing. If he's trying to win over his audience that he's logical and factual and doesn't lie, doesn't make up things, why would he do that? Why would he say the light came and then the sun replaced it? Okay, He wouldn't. Unless the person who told him about what happened actually said, this is what happened, write about it, you see. That's the only reason he would do it. Because writing it the way he did, if the creator didn't tell him to write it that way, would be stupid. Because everybody's going to say, like Stanley Yaki said, why make a light for three days and then replace it by the sun? It's just not kosher. Yeah, unless the creator told you to do that. Oh, the wall, the, that, that stops all the excuses, you see. And, the, and then we have to wonder, did Stanley, Father Stanley Yaki, did he believe that God actually told Moses to write those words? And you know what the answer is? No. That's the problem. Because Stanley Yaki bought into the JEPD theory. 
Yeah, the documentary hypothesis that Moses didn't write Genesis. That there were four anonymous Jews from different times who wrote the Pentateuch. You know why? Because Stanley got his education at the Catholic seminaries that are teaching that garbage. All of them. And where did they get it from? They got it from the liberal Protestants of the 1800s. Yeah, and the Catholics got a hold of it, and they thought, wow, this is better than studying the Bible like we were taught as kids. It just shows how, how really smart we are. We can go here and there and, you know, you know, hypothesize that this was written here in 1400, and this was written here. And all. Yeah. And it filled our seminaries and universities, and it's all from the devil, because not a word of it's true. Okay? But they thought they were being so smart. And they wrote their books, and they had their lectures, and everybody followed. Wow, you mean all these years that we've been taught that Moses wrote the Pentateuch? For, 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 we've been taught that for 1,900 years, and it's all wrong? And you, illustrious priest with your Ph.D. degrees, you're going to tell us that, no, that's all wrong? It's all, you know, Catholic stuff. You see, that's what they convinced everybody of. So you won't find a Catholic in a university today that does not believe in evolution. I can count on probably my two hands and feet the number of Catholic scholars that are creationists today. Okay. And uh, so that's what we're up against. You know, science has become the god of the modern world. And um, so with the plants thing, um, the reason there's no contradiction is because God made new plants for the Garden of Eden. Where he was going to put Adam to till it, to work in it to produce his own food. And these were special plants, okay? The other ones that were made in Genesis 1, verses 10 and 11 and 12, their general variety, shrubs and trees and all kinds of things, that they would be scattered all over the world that, that Mo, uh, Adam would never see, okay? What Adam's going to see, basically, maybe on the perimeter, he's going to see those kinds of plants God made in Genesis 1. But as far as the garden, they're made of special plants. Okay? And they're going to be made after Adam's created. Because, because they have need special care. They need special water. They need special um, cultivation. They need the weeds picked. You know? All kinds of things have to happen to make these special plants grow. And that's where he's going to get his food from. Okay, and we already know there were two special plants, special trees put in the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. Okay, so I, I wonder what these plants were that, that Adam was going to grow in the garden of Eden. They must have been really special plants, you know, giving him all the nourishment that he and, and Eve would need and their children. Okay. And never have a problem, never have a disease, never have a sickness, never having a stomach ache, you know, uh, just perfect food for the perfect family. I mean, just think of it. Okay. So that's the difference. Once you get into the story and you, and you trust the writer, Moses, instead of thinking he's just influenced by some culture, of Babylon, and it wasn't even Moses who was doing the writing. It was somebody else who lived in Babylon. He's just copying the Babylonians, you see, all that stuff. Uh, it, it's really sad. It's really sad. All right. It is 5 o'clock, so I'm going to have to go. 
Did you and your family have a happy Easter? Yes, we did. Always do. I can't think of one unhappy Easter. You know, because the weather always gets nice. And it's not too warm yet. But, um, and um, everybody's happy at church. And like we went to the Catholic church in a town here. And I told them, you're going to have to get there early. I told the rest of the family, you know, it was at 10 o'clock. And I said, you're going to have to, we're going to have to leave by quarter after nine, at least. Oh, we don't really need to leave that early. Yeah. And so we got there at 930 and the whole church was packed and they were putting them in the gym and the social room. So I'm saying, you see, so that just confirms once again, that most Catholics only go to mass on Christmas and Easter. And it, you saw it for your own eyes. And the priest was saying, and I hope you people who have come on Easter would come back again next Sunday. You know, he's very mild with them. Because if you start chastising it for only coming on Easter, they won't come on Easter next time. That's for sure. Gee. Typical Catholic. All right. Um, so we got to go. It's been nice being with you. On this April 3rd, um, let me say, so that will mean we will see you again on April 10th, okay? And let me remind you of a couple items, so you might want to browse that at robertsongenis.org. And this is the second volume of commentary on the Catholic Douay Reims New Testament, and this one is... Volume 2, St. Luke and the Acts of the Apostles. Okay? There's a beautiful picture of Mary and Jesus on the front. And it's got just wonderful pictures in there that you would like to see, I'm sure, of all the gospel passages. There's another one. There's another one. Okay, and um, that's what, how many pages is this? 700 and something, 725. There's a nice picture of Jesus there at the end. Whoops. <laughs> I should put a caption up there. Thank you for reading the New Testament. <laughs> So that is available, and <clears throat> good bedtime reading. I mean it this time. Good bedtime reading. Because you go to bed with the gospel on your mind. And what better dreams are you going to have than that? Okay. So um, also, what I was going to say. Um, 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 yeah, it's, things are getting expensive today, so. You know, in order to not lose money on this proposition, you know, we have to charge 69 or $68 for this thing. Okay, hardback. But it's got 724 pages. It's got pictures. Best exegesis of the New Testament you're going to find anywhere. You can take my word for it. And um, it's just you don't find this stuff around. You just don't. Okay. So I um, suggest you get that. You can find that on robertsongenis.org. Um, oh, people have written back and said, you know, once I pick it up and start reading, except for that, how heavy it is, I can't put it down because I get so much information. And you see, what we do here is we take the Greek language and we get the nuances out of that Greek language that you're not going to get in your English translation. It's just not there. Uh, and we explain to you, you know, in from the Greek language, what's happening. And, you know, and a lot of colloquial expressions that you get in um, from the Greek that they can't put into English. But I tell you what they mean colloquially, you know, like <laughs> sometimes, um, you know, Jesus will tell something to somebody or Paul or whatever. And, and it really means call it, get the heck out of here, you know, something like that. And I'll put that in the interpretation for you so you can see what it was like for them to say their phrases um, 
that we may say do the same thing in English. Sometimes we'll say things very genteel, you know, very circumspect. And what we really mean is something a little more vulgar. And but you know, that doesn't come out, you see. But here I make it come out. So you can see, you know, what they were really saying. And um, uh, you just get so much uh, uh, from the Greek that you don't get from the English translations. It's just uncanny. And every page is like that. Every single page. Okay. So, and then don't forget our um, supersessionism book. Supersessionism is irrevocable. Okay. And, um, you know, that's all about whether the Jews have their own covenant or not. And the answer is no. Okay. And then you want to find out why and what some Catholics have been trying to do to make it that way. And we're not going to allow them to do that. Okay. So um, uh, here's another one. Why uh, there will not be a mass conversion of the Jews at the end of time. Okay. Very important topic today. It goes along with um, the other thing about supersessionism. Um, um, what else? Um, that's it for now. Anyway, so we'll see you um, next uh, Wednesday at 10, uh, April 10th. God be with you all. God bless you and pray for me. I will pray for you. Bye-bye.